It was the 8th of June 1995, and John Rebo announced that Adelaide would be joining the Super League in 1997 as the competition's 11th franchise, with a Melbourne team likely to enter the same year. It was another blow for the ARL who were watching their vision of national expansion taking flight without them. For Super League, however, there was still one major problem. While they may have added the teams to fill out their 12-team 1997 schedule, the 10-team 1996 lineup was still one short. This is the 10th, the 21st chapter in the Rugby League Digest in-depth investigation of the Super League War. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams here with Andrew Paskin. How's it going, Andy? Mate, I am fantastic. How are you? Really good. Uh, Listeners might have noticed some uh, minor cosmetic changes to uh, the show uh, over the last couple of episodes. Uh, we should announce that we've proudly joined the Acast stable of podcasts. Uh, we're very happy to be on board with one of the biggest podcast companies around the world. So uh, yeah, thanks to Acast for having us. And thanks to the listeners for showing us loyal support and getting us there because we started as a passion project and it still is a passion project, given that we make no money and spend a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so without having you know, thousands of loyal listeners, they wouldn't have approached us. So yeah, thank you very much for your continued support, guys and girls. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and nothing else will change. We will still be doing the podcast uh, as we have been these last four years and particularly the last year with the Super League uh, series. So let's get into this week's chapter, titled The 10th, about the Super League search for a 10th franchise. And Andy, as we start, I want you to cast your mind back to the distant past when we recorded our Blitzkrieg uh, chapter. Mm. Uh, and it's fair to say that things did not go to plan for Super League. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> so I was really reminded by the, the constant stuff ups and the counterattacks and everything that went on during that point of time got Super League into a position that they did not expect themselves to be in. And this kind of continued through 1995, where suddenly, end of April, they've got to put together a random, at that stage, a Newcastle West, but a second Newcastle team, which no one could possibly have advised them that having two teams in Newcastle was a good idea. No, and it worked out that way. Yeah, exactly. They had some luck in May with the Panthers signing up and getting them to nine teams. But suddenly this competition that was going to be so exclusive and, you know, all these teams that weren't even getting spoken to because they were so far from Super League's radar, suddenly anything was on the table. Any team could have joined and Super League were going after anyone they could get to try to fill out their competition. It's just so awkward that they brush these teams and then have to come crawling back to them. It's really, really awkward. And at the same time that this was happening, you had the Queensland origin win, the Australian test team minus any Super League players easily accounting for the New Zealand team in a three test whitewash. And suddenly the ARL, despite the lack of, or despite the loss of Brisbane, Canberra, etc., were increasingly looking at like the fair dinkum competition and Super League, very strong shades of Mickey Mouse. Yeah. There's one thing you don't want for your competition. It's any links to the Disneyland characters, <laughs> especially Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, they needed a 10th franchise. They were looking for a fourth Sydney team and having talks with teams that previously wouldn't have got a look in. So in late April, you're seeing... Parramatta, Balmain, both having talks with Super League. Yeah, it's interesting that one with the Balmain. I'm surprised they were even having talks. And I haven't, I'm not going too much into detail into those talks because I don't think in either case they got very far at all. And I think part of that is that most of the players were committed by that point. So it's hard to see teams jumping ship without any players. Mm. But so at this point, Super League started thinking outside just this idea of a fourth Sydney team. And with anything on the table, they looked to South Queensland. And that's not necessarily the crushers, although that's where those talks ended up. So on top of that, there was also the possibility of a completely new entity being formed in South Queensland, which with Ray Stevens, who was the mayor of the Gold Coast, uh, as opposed to the Lord Mayor of Gooseville in Brisbane. <laughs> so, 
saying in the press that he'd been asked to make a formal license application for an expanded team in 1997. So this wasn't that 10th team, but it still goes to show you how Super League were thinking. So they were still in the process of deciding where all these teams were going to end up and how they were going to get to 12. The theme song for Gold Coast Rugby League should be Fool's Gold by the Stone Roses. <laughs> how is it possible that Super League were getting sucked into that uh, money pit as well? It really boggles the mind. And on top of that, at the same time, you had the ARL in talks with Redcliffe about the possibility of Redcliffe joining the ARL as a second Brisbane team. That's amazing. What do you think would have happened if that had occurred? Do you think they'd be still there now? No, I, I don't. Like, <laughs> and I should say, like with the talks with the Sydney clubs, none of this really got too far advanced. Uh, Redcliffe were potentially in the mix to join a second Auckland team uh, in 1996. Both of those sound ill-advised, but if it did come to fruition with Redcliffe, maybe this uh, second Brisbane team, Malaki, would have been put to bed earlier. Well, I don't think this is the right environment to test it, because suddenly you've gone from the Brisbane Broncos dominating the market with the Gold Coast there as well. The crush is coming in in 1995. So potentially within a year or two, you could have had two Gold Coast teams and three Brisbane teams across the two competitions. <laughs> Uh, potentially you could have had zero Gold Coast teams at any given time as well. So <laughs> it just goes to show how how um, floundering the ARL were as well, because I mean, a second Auckland team, just madness. It is. But again, I want to reiterate that all these situations were very unlikely to happen. These were just ideas that were tossed out. I suppose it doesn't hurt to at least hear everything out, does it? So it, Exactly. So I don't want to be too harsh on the ARL or Super League. In this respect, they were just preliminary talks. I think the ARL were talking to the boss of Redcliffe. The Gold Coast mayor saying he was asked to submit an application is interesting. But again, that's probably just diligence on the part of Super League covering all bases rather than we definitely think there should be a second team in the Gold Coast. Yeah, right. The reason I wanted to bring these up was just to demonstrate the scrambling nature of everything that was going on in this time. For the ARL to put a flag down outside of Sydney and for the Super League to consolidate their competition. So anything was on the table. But making this possible on the Super League side was the Broncos waiving the exclusivity agreement they had with Super League uh, on the South Queensland market. So this was something I don't think that was done willingly by the Broncos. The Broncos at the time in the press came out and said that they were right behind it because of you know, how much they believed in Super League and, and if it'll enhance the competition and we're right behind it. But you have to remember, this is six months on from Paul Morgan accusing the ARL of trying to root the Broncos <laughs> by setting up the crushes. And that was all down to you know fears about the Broncos' bottom line. So there was talk that Shane Edwards, the Broncos' Uh, CEO fell out with John Rebo at this time. So I think there was some genuine tension from the Broncos about what Super League were doing with uh, trying to entice the Crushers to join. I think definitely that would have caused it. But I mean, Rebo seems like a guy it's easy to fall out with at this period. Yeah. <laughs> the only argument for the Broncos being willing for Super League to engage in talks with the Crushers is what Mike Coleman argues in the Super League book that get the crushes and the ARL falls. It genuinely does just become a Sydney or regional New South Wales competition. Although it is hard to see the crushes being that final, you know, crushing blow. Yeah. But regardless, by early June, the crushes were the only club yet to formally link with either Super League or the ARL, which is kind of telling from the ARL's side that they hadn't locked them up by that point. It's weird on both sides. I mean, I would think you'd have to show loyalty to the organization that brought you alive <laughs> for a start. But yeah. then um, I don't know what they were waiting for. They had the whole of Brisbane they needed to look after and now Brisbane was gone. And on the players' side, when all this crazy money's getting thrown around, so Graham Mackay, Nigel Gaffey and Terry Cook all got a hundred grand sign-on bonus from the ARL. Mario Fennick got 60 no one else really rates a mention on the, the ARL like payments list. It's almost like that laid back uh, banana bender Queensland <laughs> stereotype was in full effect. Yeah. Like I know Scott Sattler, who was there at the Crushers, said that he got, it was about 10 grand. It was like basically nothing. So there was no favoured treatment for him. Mm. And on the Super League side, Wayne Collins got an edmed three-year $470,000 deal. But beyond that, there was 
not much interest in Crush's players either. Crazy. But so suddenly by June, the Crushers found themselves in hot demand with the ARL heading up to Queensland to try to secure them, Super League putting in an offer of their own. Uh, and it really seemed that the Crushers going to Super League was a distinct possibility. That would be absolutely mind-blowing if that happened. I suppose, I mean, Auckland did it, but I mean, <laughs> North Queensland did it. But It would have been for a couple of reasons, just for that being the fourth, like all four new clubs defecting from the ARL yeah. within a few months of, of starting. Secondly, the fact that they were, you know, started by the QRL, like there was such strong links with the establishment that it, it really would have been amazing if they did go. If all four went, it would have been Graham Langland's level ungratefulness. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, as we've said previously, you couldn't really hold it against the other clubs when they signed up to join the national competition and there was only one of the two competitions that was really in a position to offer that. Yeah. So after getting an offer from both sides, uh, Dick Tosser Turner had this to say. We're not about to be pushed into any overnight decision guided by either Mr. Packer or Mr. Murdoch. We're in no hurry. We're looking at the proposition we've been offered today, and we've, we have to look at our options. It's one of the great rugby league nicknames, that Dick Tosser Turner. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a real character, too. And he's someone, he was someone who'd been involved with Origin from the start. Like, he was QRL through and through. It was really hard to see him ever defecting. But you can see the, there's some forcefulness in his words there that he wasn't going to be pushed around and he was going to do what he thought was best for the crushers. The problem was that there was some real tension between the crushers and News Limited. And I think this there's a historical holdover from that with how much the Broncos pushed against the crushers inclusion and made life difficult for them. It's only natural that there would be animosity on me. Yeah, yeah. But so all through 1995, the way that the News Limited Press, particularly the Courier Mail, were coming out talking about how the crushers were fudging crowd figures or, you know, they got a crowd of 20,000, but there were 16,000 free tickets, really undermining them at every success they made, you know, in those early stages of their existence. <laughs> the Courier Mail, they are so pro Bronco, <laughs> it's not funny. But then suddenly when the situation changed, you had the Courier Mail, you know, basically saying the Crushers need to sign with Super League. And the Crushers were under intense pressure from all these people coming at them saying that you'll be gone if you stay with the ARL. This is your chance to save yourself. But I think that inbuilt tension plus the, the close ARL links that they had meant that it was always going to be a hard sell for the Crushers. So this is what Tossa Turner said about it in the end. That was the thing that upset me and a tremendous number of Queenslanders. It was not the concept, which I think everyone agreed had some merit. It was that this clandestine operation had been perpetrated by Queenslanders. Now, while a lot of Queenslanders might say, screw New South Wales or screw the ARL or whatever, that is never going to be at the risk of destroying the fabric of the game. This whole thing was not about control of the game. It was about owning the game. There's a fundamental difference. And in my mind, it was simply not acceptable. And so with that, with his deciding vote, Turner cast it for the ARL. Uh, and that was it, basically, in terms of the Crushers' dalliance with Super League. They remained loyal to the ARL, and Super League had to keep looking. I think that's a very uh, impressive quote, that he's one of the only ones that spoke some truth there about it's got some merit, but it's still not what we want. Yeah. But that Queenslander quote, I mean, isn't that just describing Queenslander behavior? <laughs> <laughs> Doing anything to win, backdooring you, that type of thing. But the funny thing about it is that all the people urging them that Super League was their only chance. You can't say for sure that they were right because who knows what happens if they do go with Super League. They might have been sacrificed just as the Reds and you know the, the Rams were definitely, at the end of it all. Definitely would have been sacrificed. And why wouldn't they be? They had no seniority in the lineup. Of course they would have gone. Yeah. But in the end, the ARL couldn't save them and they were in no position to save themselves. Like We mentioned them holding merger talks with the Gold Coast before they'd even kicked off in their first game. Those money problems continued by August 1996. They were in voluntary administration, debts of $4 million. I don't know if there's a way out of that with Super League or with different administration. I don't know how it plays out. But I really hate people using the Crushers as an example of why a second Brisbane team wouldn't work, though. Yeah, it's a bit, um, bit hard when you've got both hands tight behind your back and one of your legs cut off. Yeah, I think you can make that case without resorting to the Crushers. So with the Crushers out, 
Super League turned their attention back to Sydney and with another team that was at first uh, an unlikely target, and that's North Sydney. So Norths were coming on, as we've spoken about in the past, we love that mid-90s North team. They were coming into power at or coming into strength as a team at a very fortunate time. They did have a, a fairly weak 1995. That was a bit of an outlier uh, among the, the mid-90s. Having that really good squad put them in a position above that of, say, Balmain or South, where although they didn't have the biggest fan base and they were struggling financially, at least they had players that were legitimate targets for Super League. Mm. The other couple of things that Super League could capitalise on were, one, an uncertain future that Norths faced. So by this point, there were already talks about moving to the Central Coast. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, yeah. I know the stadium wasn't ready yet at this time, but if they had agreed to be already go off their own bat prior to Super League or as it was happening, do you think they'd still be here, Central Coast Bears? This is a question I've thought so much about, and I, I honestly don't know. Like, I don't know if... Like, people always say just, oh, the Central Coast, Central Coast Bears, it's a no-brainer. But then there are people who make a valid point about the Central Coast as a region, whether it is big enough to sustain a team. I think the thing about the Bears going there then is they would have retained their old fan base and their old geographical area while adding a big Central Coast nursery to that. So Plenty of local juniors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I say yes. My theory on this has always been it makes sense for a relocation team only. Yeah, the expansion yeah. team makes zero sense because no it doesn't add yeah. any more no. uh, TV revenue or anything like that. Yeah. But for North Sydney, it was, to me, it was a no-brainer because they were just up the road from their fan base of 5,000 that, that attended the games at the hardcore yeah. who still would have gone there anyway. Then they had the whole region to themselves and it got rid of one Sydney team. I think it was perfection. But yeah. Alas, it didn't happen. It was perfection then, which probably would have kept them going until now but basically once they were out once the northern eagles fell apart any talk about relocating a team to the central coast for me like now it's too late you know that's not a big enough step if you're going to relocate so yeah so that uncertainty was one thing that super league could capitalize on the other thing was some bitterness from the players about how norths had handled the, the Super League situation, and more importantly, the communication that had been given to them. So Billy Moore, writing in the Rugby League Week in 1995, said this, One of the main reasons we approached Super League was curiosity. After Super League approached the club a couple of months ago, the North Sydney board wrote a letter to every player explaining why they'd rejected the opportunity. Among the reasons was that if North had joined Super League, they would have had less than 50% control of the club and that there was an entrance fee. When they made their initial offer, the Bears were not a big priority for Super League, but as they struggled to get a final franchise and representation from Sydney's North, the Bears became a huge priority. At around that same time, Super League told a few of our players what they'd offered our management. When it didn't match up with what was outlined in the letter, all hell broke loose. That's not a Sydney club rugby league board manoeuvre, I don't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. So the players were like furious over that. <laughs> Can you picture these guys like the Brill train types? Like, like, I think we need to pull the wool over the eyes a bit here. I don't think the boys can handle it. We'll just um, massage the truth a bit. What do you reckon? Yeah, totally. And on top of that, they were down on the ARL as well, uh, in a big part because of the Filthy Four. Right. So not only the payments that the Filthy Four and other people who came back to the ARL got over the ones that were loyal from the start, but the fact that Jason Smith was selected to play for Australia over Billy Moore. That became a real sticking point as well. If you get, like, um, of course, personal issues and selection issues and stuff like that would come into it. Yeah, of, of course. course, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll refer everyone back to Nick Campton's brilliant series on the North Sydney Bears at this time. Uh, this is a quote from Mark Soden in that article. We got everyone to go to talk to them, and even Flo walked out and couldn't believe the bullshit we'd been told by our own club. I pleaded with Flo because everyone would follow him. I said, Flo, if we sign with the ARL, we'll be gone in 10 years. This is our chance to get away from Manly. The power base is Fulton, Arthurson and Kerry Packer. Manly people. You think they care about us? They want our vote. They want our number, and they don't want us. News Limited are throwing everything at us. You name your price, Flo. Tell them what the ARL will give you, and they'll probably double it. I was literally on my hands and knees, because if Flo went, we'd all go. But we did what we did. Flo would have been absolutely devastated at the board's line of the players. So, yeah, he was. The whole team was. 
and maybe their big mistake was instead of taking that anger to Super League and signing contracts, they took it to the club to hold a players and board honesty session. <laughs> So uh, Billy Moore says, the issue was resolved during an intense two-hour session, which involved all of the guys firing questions at the board. It was no holds barred stuff, and I have to give the board a wrap here. How many company boards would allow all of their supposedly disgruntled, and many were, employees, to grill them under no set agenda? As a result of that session, everyone had a lot clearer picture, which allowed us to make an informed and, in my opinion, correct decision. I love in rugby league, it's almost like the Gommel saw to ref the game fair dinkum. You can be lying and backstabbing and skullduggery until you declare it an honesty <laughs> session and then it's on it. And so they made the decision to stay with the ARL. They very publicly came out and said, we're loyal to each other. We're not loyal to the board. We're not loyal to the ARL. We want to stick together. This is what we see as our best option to do that. So we're staying with the ARL. Rock solid. And in that Nick Campton article, he asked the key players about their regrets, where they feel they'd be now if they'd have made it. You can see the heat in Mark Soden's statements that I, I think he definitely thinks they made a mistake by sticking loyal. Flo said, I have a shitload of regrets, but I don't think about them. I just get on with it. That's a, such a Flo comment, just a positive bloke. <laughs> I just think... They would have had more chance by going to the Central Coast as a standalone Bears operation than they had sticking solid. Yeah, you're probably right. These are all maybes, though, and it's you, you can hear it in the, in the measured way all the, the players talk about it. You know, I, I mentioned Flo and Mark Soden. and Billy Moore was the same. But they're right that they're on the chopping block, and Arthurson and Fulton and co. would have loved to see them gone if someone had to go. Yeah, but regardless, so at this point, North Board never really entertained Super League. North's players in... July made this decision that they were going to stick together and stay with the ARL. That didn't end it in terms of A North Sydney with Super League. So it was being reported through uh, August, September that the 10th team was penciled in as either Northern Suburbs or North S. A Gladys Craven article in, in the Sun Herald saying, the hottest rumour around town during the week was that a certain club would like to join Super League where they would go by the sobriquet of the Grizzlies. <laughs> Instead of the Bears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. That's a typical Super League Americanized idiot idea right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was like a one-off reporting. And again, I don't think there's much, if anything, to that. But it was being talked about a lot that there's going to be a, a North Sydney team in Super League, uh, which very possibly could have been the Dragons. So we mentioned that in our last episode that the Dragons came very close to signing with Super League. This is the point that that was happening around September, uh, where there was a lot of talk about this fourth Sydney franchise being north of the harbour. There was talk about the Dragons actually being based out of North Sydney Oval and playing in the Super League. How would you have felt about that? It, it just wouldn't have made any sense. It doesn't fit St. George, North no Shore, just does not. And I don't think that's actually would have happened. What would have happened? I think there's a couple of separate uh, things being put together in this instance. So the St. George signing to Super League was on the cards. There were meetings happening. It was leaking into the press. The other thing is that at this point, it was reported by Ian Heads in the Sun Herald that Super League had lodged a 14-page proposal with North Sydney Council uh, to hold matches at North Sydney Oval for the next five years. That blows me away. You're spruiking this brand new vision with high-tech entertainment and stadiums and you go, can we have the ground with the tree in it, please? It's <laughs> <laughs> And this is another thing where Super League's initial plans and expectations could not have included a fig tree. I cannot believe that. <laughs> yeah, it just goes to show how far it fell apart when the Boots Creek turned into a pop gun. Yeah. And I mean, in the actual Super League year, in Sydney, there was one game played at the SFS. Every other game was at Belmore and, and Shaft Park, you know, at Penrith as well, which, like, it doesn't scream Super League, you know, modern, the vision, the future to me, playing at, at Belmore Oval. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I think having a fig tree is better than having a kennel. <laughs> <laughs> or a train line, you know, <laughs> in, in place of, of a, a grandstand. And so Ray Beattie at the Bears came out against the idea of Super League playing there, saying, 
The fact is, we've been at North Sydney Oval longer than the fig tree. If someone tried to cut down the fig tree, there would be an uproar. And in the same way, the bears are synonymous with the ground. That article led to a uh, rebuttal from the mayor of North Sydney, Jeannie McCaffrey, uh, the following week. Uh, so I'm just going to read this. I would like to state that North Sydney Oval is a community facility and belongs to the people of North Sydney, not to any one sporting club in particular. For as long as the North Sydney District Rugby League has been at the Oval, it has also been the home of the North Sydney Cricket Club and Northern Suburbs Rugby Union Club. Many other sporting clubs use the Oval, and they all have equal importance in the eyes of the council. Last year it was used for 65 sporting events. Only 11 of those will win Phil Cup matches. The Oval is used for many other community events, including a papal mass, and this year it will host the very popular Movies in the Park. I've been in the area 10 years, and the Bears have even escaped my memory, and I'm a massive rugby league fan. I mean, it's about the Oval. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> we should have mentioned this before in the Crushers discussion, but the fact that the Crushers were playing out of Lang Park, aka Suncorp Stadium, and the Broncos were out of ANZ, a monstrosity with 200 metres between the sideline and the first seats, that would have given the Crushers quite a big leg up because Lang Park was so beloved and yeah. good for footy and everything. That, yeah, that, that's a really good point. That would have been a really good selling point for them. And maybe that accounts for the, the good crowds they were able to sustain throughout 1995 and 1996. Yeah, ANZ just wasn't pretty. No. So I, ju I just love this aspect of the story. It's so illustrative of the position Super League were in at this point to be resorting to submitting proposals to North Sydney Council to use what North Sydney Bears marketing manager described as a lovely Edwardian icon. <laughs> but uh, it's probably one of those cases of, of covering all your bases as well, just in case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I don't think in April, Super League were thinking about submitting proposals to play at North Sydney Oval. So with North out, with St George not signing with Super League, that was basically it for Sydney in the short term. So... Super League had to cut their losses and go back to a city that had already been announced as a Super League franchise for 1997. You have to remember at this point before the court case, the idea was that Super League was going to start in 1996 as a 10-team competition, expanding to 12 teams in 1997 with Adelaide and likely Melbourne. To me, 10 teams is far too little. I think that comes down to the fact that 12 teams was planned at the start, but the original plan was for the competition to start in 1997. It was only when the ARL counter-attack happened and everything blew up that Super League had to fast track and make it start in 1996. So mm. I don't think this two-tiered starting point was the Super League ideal. It was just the, the position they found themselves in. Yeah. So I mentioned Adelaide being announced. That was actually the same day that the Crushers refused to accept that initial offer from the ARL, which was the 8th of June. John Rebo was in Adelaide finalising the agreement for Adelaide to come in as the 11th franchise in 1997. So Adelaide were locked in by June. I just wanted to start this section by going into how they got there. So the first game of rugby league to be played in Adelaide was in 1914. Uh, that was against an English touring side uh, that stopped in Adelaide. They put together a local team. Uh, 2,000 turned out, which was a decent crowd. Uh, the English won 101 to nil. Very similar figures to the World Club Challenge 70 years later. <laughs> and in the intervening decades, not much happened, but that all changed in the early 90s with the New South Wales Rugby League taking games there. The first game was St George taking on Balmain. Uh, this took place on the 28th of June, 1991. I don't know if I remember the first one, but I remember all the one-off games after that, I think, and they were always awesome. Yeah, and got respectable crowds. So that first game got 30,000 people, which is pretty amazing. It's a different kettle of fish, though, the one-off. I mean, if Newcastle had an AFL game come to it before the Swans as like a novelty, I think they would have got 30,000 of that. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And you, you saw the ARL try it with Balmain in 1994, taking three of their games there, testing the waters potentially for Balmain or another team to go down there or to set up a fresh team. Got a, I, th I think it was 15,000, 20,000, a very respectable crowd the first game. That basically halved the second and they canned the third. So it is very important to be wary of putting too much stock in those one-off crowd figures. 
but it was certainly something they were pushing, getting more and more games there, even if that wasn't for a move on the cards, just to keep the profile up, was it, it was a worthwhile endeavour. These games didn't come out of nowhere, they were actually part of a push from a man named Peter Morgan, who was from New South Wales, was living in Adelaide as a journalist, uh, but you know, loved rugby league, and started promoting rugby league in South Australia, had a relationship with the South Australian Rugby League. That eventually led to putting pressure on the ARL to start bringing games there. And so that first game was a result of that. And so Peter Morgan became passionate behind the, the idea of rugby league in Adelaide. And he was in fact the driving force of the idea of a team being based out of Adelaide. So well before Super League, he was thinking about this and putting what a, legend. a proposal together. So it, he even had the name sorted uh, again, sort out the name well before the bid. Uh, so he was going to call the team the Adelaide Aces. I thought that was a killer name at the time, but now looking back, I don't like its gambling connotations. <laughs> Especially because the idea came that they would offer the sponsorship rights to the Adelaide Casino. Yeah. And it's like, well, what, what about in four years when they walk away from the sponsorship and <laughs> you're lumbered with this name that is no longer representative of anything to do with you? I remember seeing the Rams and hating it, thinking it was just a cheap copycat of the LA Rams in the NFL. But it has, regardless of that, it has strong Australian connections, and especially in South Australia, like it's a real yeah. pastoral. Uh, you could make that case that there is a traditional Australian element to it. What about the Adelaide imperialists because of their stupid beer measurements? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but you've got to give the guy props. I mean putting that work in early, it's, to me, it's still a, a very rich opportunity for rugby league. Definitely. And without that legwork that Peter Morgan did, there's no way Adelaide are locked in as that 11th franchise so quickly. And we'll get to that part of the story very soon. Before we do get there, I, I just wanted to note how funny it was that almost from the start, I think even before there'd been talks within Super League, it was in the press that there was going to be an Adelaide team. So the 4th of April... A story leaks that uh, Wallaby coach Bob Dwyer had been linked with the coaching job of a Melbourne or Adelaide Super League club. The amount of rugby union coaches and players that we just thought were going to be changing over to rugby league back then and it was all going to be fine. Yeah. Now, like, uh, everyone's very suspicious of a union convert. Yeah. And he basically came out in the press and said, I don't like rugby league. Why would I do that? <laughs> So that was on the 4th of April. By the 30th of April, there were reports that St. George were going to relocate to Adelaide with Super League in 1997. I reckon there's some teams kicking themselves they didn't do it because as, you, as you're driving to your second ground, it's not in your area every second week, you'd be going, you know what? We could be the Dragons in Melbourne or Adelaide or we could be the Tigers in Adelaide. The funny thing is with the Dragons, even though it became a real possibility later on in the story, at this point, April 1995, the only thing linking them to Adelaide was the fact that they were sponsored by Penfold. <laughs> that was the only link that the story put together, and that sponsorship was about to end anyway. So There's so many uh, hypothetical linkages in rugby league journalism that, that just become fact. It's like, well, um, he, he was born in the Central Coast. I'm sure he'll be coming back to play for the Bears. <laughs> This chapter in particular has really laid that all out for me. Like I've put all these little stories in and I'll say, wait, this, oh, so this happened. And then you'll find that there's like a three line article, you know, in one paper in July, 1995 that said, this is definitely happening. Yeah. And that's the only mention of that story, like in the entire saga of the war. But we all believe it. Every time we pick up a paper in rugby league. Yeah. <laughs> this discussion's really opened up a few cans of worms in my head about the whole idea about the ARL sticking solid with to be loyal to the tribalism and the fan base and it, it means so much to the community and all this sort of stuff. Now what have we got? We've got teams playing across cities in areas where the traditional fans don't even live, four different grounds, you know, this absolute hodgepodge and we all just gloss over it with rose-coloured glasses in real time. Well, it's funny, that's become a new iteration of the traditionalist argument with South. When you say, oh, South and East are neighbouring, it's like, well, no, because South they're really based at Homebush now. That's their geographical area. It's like, well, you're either traditional or you're not, you know, like you're either yeah. South Sydney or you're... But that's beside the point. I, I don't want to get bogged down that in that yet again. No. 
An another fortunate thing Adelaide had for them was timing. And that was the fact that the Grand Prix, which had been at Adelaide for many years, was leaving and going to Melbourne where it still is today. So suddenly you had a big hole in the Adelaide sporting scene and Adelaide tourism that the government at the time were eager to try to fill. So the opposition leader actually came to Peter Morgan because of the work he'd done in Spruik in Rugby League, knowing what was happening to Super League, got together with Morgan to put stories out, to put pressure on the Premier, Dean Brown, to try to bring Super League to Adelaide. It's so odd that to me that they would just look at it as like a business thing. Odd, but it worked. So the government took the bait, basically, and got behind the Super League concept, made land available for training facilities, club rooms, etc., and the Adelaide Super League franchise was up and running. The only problem for Peter Morgan is that it was to happen without him. So he didn't expect to be running the, the organisation. That wasn't his strength or interest. He thought at the very least he'd get, you know, a job in the marketing or um, media departments. That didn't really happen. He was basically put aside. He did have the rights to the Aces name, which Super League bought off him uh, for next to nothing. He didn't make much of it. But then they decided to move on from that anyway, so... At least you got some money out of it. Well, in Mike Coleman's account, the money he got barely covered his costs, so it, he didn't really get much out of it at all. It's so weird that in a sport where jobs for the boys is part of the fabric, and they were throwing money away through incinerators, that they couldn't give this guy a job in marketing, right? Yeah, it's, it's sad, and I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it, and, you know, they got someone else to do the job, it, it was, you know, maybe like just a news limited insider, mm. jobs for the boys thing, I don't know, regardless, it, it's a, a bit disappointing for Morgan, doubly so when they eventually walked away from the Aces name, so Ken Cowley was concerned about the gambling connotations, while John Rebo then came out and said that the name was too soft and didn't have the required identity and branding necessary for a Super League team. I agree with him there. But this is the start of the missteps, though. They say, okay, we've got the Rams, we've stolen an American name, um, that fits our thing. Why don't we steal the Newcastle Knights colours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure rugby league fans won't notice that. <laughs> that is truly bizarre, that, that one. Especially in 1998. Yeah. Like... If they were to keep playing in 1998, they had to change the uniform. Yeah, crazy. So as I said, at the same time, Super League announced that Melbourne would be there as well in 1997. The South Australian Rugby League defected to Super League. There was the very real prospect of the Victorian Rugby League doing the same. They eventually stuck solid with the ARL, which is very surprising. The South Australian Rugby League picked up its handkerchief and tied it to a stick <laughs> and then defected. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, it doesn't sound much, but it's still an area that the ARL had developed. You know, whether they'd done enough, whether they put a huge amount of effort into it, it's an association they had that suddenly was gone. Mm. So I don't know why the Victorian Rugby League didn't when there was definite plans for Super League to start there. The ARL had talked about a Melbourne team coming in in 98, but I mean... Whether that would have happened beforehand, who knows? Certainly in this environment, everything was up in the air. When you've got an almost definite, it's a bit hard to see why they didn't go with that. Yeah. The South Australian defection did lead to some uh, pettiness from John Quayle, who immediately called in a $100,000 loan uh, that <laughs> he'd given to the South Australian Rugby League. He said, I believe News Limited have offered to pay me the loan for them, so we look forward to getting $100,000 of Mr Murdoch's money tomorrow. That's funny, but it's also highly uh, indicative of the reason why the ARL was where they're at. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're getting $100,000 of Mr Murdoch's money, but then you're spending $500 million of Mr Packers and opposites. <laughs> It seems like rugby league people are more interested in vindictiveness and winning the, the battle than even thinking about the war. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess it's inbuilt into the culture, isn't it? It's, it's hard to change that mindset. But the conversation would have been like, I heard um, South Australian Rugby League left to John. But yeah, but as soon as they left, I called the marker and <laughs> got them back. <laughs> so St George re rejecting Super League at that point was the catalyst for Adelaide joining the competition as the 10th franchise. 
So they were announced on the 13th of December that they would be the 10th franchise starting in 1996, which basically gave them a couple of months to put a team together to compete, which is always a, a, a big disadvantage. Especially in that time, asking people to go across the country was like saying, would you mind cutting your left arm off for me? Yeah. And they went all out with some of the, the players they went after. So Laurie Daly was offered a share in the franchise. Mike Coleman puts it as similar to the situation in the US with Magic Johnson of the Lakers and the Chicago Bulls' Michael Jordan. But I think it's similar in having a share only. That's about the only similarity. <laughs> it's a bit like David Beckham going to LA Galaxy, though. Yeah. Those franchises were already massive as opposed to a startup. Yeah. And they had crowds and money and, and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what do you think would have happened if Laurie went there? I mean, that would have been far, far better, obviously. Well, he hopefully could have dragged some other top talent across with him. I, th I think that's, that's the biggest thing. Ian Roberts was keen at one stage. It looked like he was a likely signing. John Lomax as well. So they were both Again, fait accompli. They were both widely being reported as heading to Adelaide. But Ian Roberts was already broken down. Yeah, he was finished. Uh, George Gregan was the other one. He was offered a big deal to go there. George Gregan signing to Rugby League was the Quake Cooper signing to Rugby League of yearly stories. Yeah. Back then. Uh, so he didn't really entertain it much, like swiftly rejected it. So Kerrod Walters became their marquee signing. I always respect Kerrod for that because... I mean, he was off the radar for three, four, five years before that. Yeah, but he certainly went over with the right attitude. And, yeah, I love him for it. And his words, I enjoyed it immensely. I went with the attitude of contributing to the goal of making rugby league a success in South Australia. Good attitude. Do you think Fatty was on the money that maybe the crowd stayed away because of the state of Kerrod's melon with the show? <laughs> <laughs> but outside of Kerrod and his melon, there wasn't a lot there. So uh, Chris Quinn, there was a bloke I liked at St. George. Kurt Wrigley, Rod Maybon, decent signing. Uh, Kevin Campion from the Gold Coast was a, a good get. That was a key get because they had hardness of the pack with him. Uh, Steve Stone from Canberra, the, the other one. So there's a, a few names sprinkled in there. It was never going to be enough. You would have hoped the extra year maybe gave them time to get a few you know, better players into the mix. But the squad they'd assembled for 1996 became the basis of that 1997 team. Uh, which, again, wasn't going to be enough. Maybe also not going to be enough was their choice of coach, which was Rod Reddy. So Rod Reddy, Dragons legend, uh, was an assistant coach at the Dragons under Brian Smith and had been announced as Smith's replacement uh, for 1996 and beyond. Uh, an announcement in which he said he'd be going from the cellar to the top because he was a cellarman at the St. George Leagues Club at the time. <laughs> so he was, uh, you know, Dragons legend taking on the job. Rumours came out in early December that he was going to Adelaide, which he said, no, that I, I haven't had an offer, I haven't been approached by anyone about it. As far as I'm concerned, I'm under contract with St. George for the next two years, uh, and that's that. And then a week later, he was announced as the Rams coach. Why would he give up coaching the Dragons for Adelaide? It's insane. And, and Reddy is reviled by Dragons fans to this day for it. So in 1995, he was second only to Jeff Carr on the Dragons fan shit list. This was his reasoning. He said, when you make a decision in your life, you've got to follow it through. I still feel that I made the right decision in view of the fact that Danny Robinson, who was the GM of the Leagues Club, indicated to me that he didn't think St. George would be there in two to three years because they could no longer compete in the marketplace. Every coach wants to coach at the highest level and get the best players. If the people above you aren't interested in doing that, then you're wasting your time coaching there. You're better off going somewhere where you at least have a chance of reaching that level. I mean, surely coaching an established team for one or two years and getting your resume and coaching up to scratch would have been a better option than going to Adelaide and coaching a thrown together mess for one year before they fall. Well, yeah, that's the thing. St. George doesn't have to be there in three or four years. Like, you've never coached before. You're at the team that you played for, everyone likes and knows you, you know the players. Half the time, that's a re recipe for a disastrous coaching tenure anyway yeah but yeah i think it was a better hand than the one he jumped shit for uh to go to adelaide do you think the guy that was um upset at jeff card a decade later about the east merger at the ground would be yelling out at rocket ready today or? <laughs> I, I guarantee you he still hasn't forgiven him <laughs> but so with the court case the rams were out of action for the year rod ready took it in good spirit saying 
Two first grade coaching appointments and they haven't got a team out of the blocks yet. I'd hate to be reading my resume. But beyond Rocket, it was finding homes for 50 or so Rams players. So in a lot of cases, that was to go back to their old clubs, either for a year or for the foreseeable future. Some players didn't have clubs, so Rod Maybon ended up going to Parramatta for 1996. Kevin Campion came to St. George, which was the best to have in there in 1996. It was only years later that I worked out that he only played at the Dragons for one year. I mean, we say it every time we talk about him on this show, but everywhere he went, the team improved. Yeah, they go to the grand final that year. So much of that story was unlikely. I can't say that him being there was the difference, but certainly when you look at how thin that forward pack was, uh, having Kevin Camping in there, massive assistance. Well, you saw when Bennett brought Jeremy Smith in, just having an enforcer, which makes you second guess running that side of the field, he creates space for his team and then limits space for the other because they're all bunched up on the other side. Yeah, yeah. I love Kevin Campion. Uh, but this isn't the, the Kevin Campion appreciation now. We'll, we'll have that some other time. That's basically the show, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but so this is the environment that Adelaide found themselves in. Not an ideal start thrown into chaos by this court case, which, so unlike most of the other teams that could just go back and play as business as usual, the Rams didn't know if there was any future for them at all. It's not the situation you want to be in as a new franchise. And as a result, they kind of limped into 1997 and were never really given a fair shake because of the circumstances in which they entered the comp. All that's no good, right? Those obstacles you described then. But it's the basics of rugby league expansion team you need three really good players at a minimum you can't just have yep. um, a few veterans and some fringe first graders otherwise you're setting yourself up to fail yeah i mean go back to our brisbane and gold coast history corner gold coast were in basically the exact same situation where they had about six weeks to put a team together before the start of their and south season. as well when they come back into the comp yeah yeah i mean the only thing that saved south was russell crowe otherwise they're probably still limping along Gold Coast in that first, second, third iteration were always, always, always struggling to keep up because of the start they had. Like, it wasn't until the Titans where they actually built the team out of genuine marquee players that they had success upon entry. You know, it, it didn't take them long to become a decent team. I mean, it took them even less time to fall off the cliff again, but that initial success was possible because of the the team they put together for year one no new fan base wants to watch which would have been a good headline the also rams <laughs> but give them a chance to compete in the first year like it's just basic yeah exactly but adelaide rams in 1997 that's a story for another day this is the end of our chapter i, I want to dedicate this chapter to the adelaide rams twitter account my favorite twitter account out there <laughs> Uh, so we'd love to hear from them and from any of you, uh, any of your thoughts and memories, the Rugby League Digest at gmail.com, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we should also mention that uh, you, Andrew, have uh, ventured out off on your own. What's going on? Well, there's been a Super League situation uh, in our relationship. I have my own comedy podcast now about comedy and crime called the Andrew Paskin Podcast, the most narcissistic title possible. So if there's anybody out there into true crime and comedy, we had some very raw interviews with some comedians and some people involved in crime, lawyers and reformed criminals and judges and those type of people. So tune in. Please do. Yeah, I listened to your first episode with uh, Sean Woodland, hilarious comedians, and really enjoyed that chat. So uh, so similarly, I, I would invite all our listeners to get on top of that too, the Andrew Paskin podcast. Thank you, mate. Just before we go, I, I do have to make an announcement about the short-term future of, of this show. We're not immune to world events. I thought... I was going to be able to soldier on with my research through COVID. Uh, it's got to the stage where I need some physical resources that I don't currently have access to with this lockdown. Uh, I was thinking maybe I could cobble something together, but as soon as I formed those thoughts, I was like, well, we can't be meticulous and comprehensive for 21 chapters and then cobble something together for the final two of this season. So agreed. We are basically going to wait until we can get these chapters done right. So what that means is the next chapter, uh, I think will be two weeks away. I'm fairly confident that I have enough to finish my research for that. 
I'm hoping that will then give us enough for the final chapter in this season, two weeks after that. So you're looking at uh, a fortnightly release schedule for the next month. Uh, I'm hoping that's the case. We're going to have to see how the situation plays out. Uh, so I do apologize for that, but getting it right is uh, the most important thing for us. So uh, it's unavoidable uh, in this climate. Uh, but with that, we will speak to you in two weeks with the 22nd chapter uh, of the Super League War. Uh, so thank you so much for listening and we will speak to you soon. Toodaloo.